I'm not going to talk very much about products today at all. I'm going to show you a few clips of the products, but really talk more about the experience of going and setting the company up, uh, our experiences there with this, how it's gone over the years, the marketing, and then maybe come back to these actual, at the second half of the presentation, more about market innovation, position, brand identity, maybe talk through these briefly a couple of points and maybe my thoughts in some pieces. Uh, this is my experience as a designer working in Finland. This is not necessarily the way all, all small micro companies maybe go or designers or crafts people. Just personally, our experience with doing it and my feelings about, let's say, where I am in Finland at the moment and the position there. Uh, I have to get just... No? This one? Okay. <laughs> so, uh, I moved to Finland in, uh, as a... First, I went as an exchange student in 94. I studied in industrial design in Ireland. Then I went back to Finland to do a master's in ceramics and glass. Upon completing my, my uh, studies there in 98, I had designed the Warm Series as my thesis work and came in position what to do now. And uh, then with another colleague, Tony Ostrom, at the time, we decided that our only real option was actually to set up our own company. Uh, ironically enough, in Finland, there's quite a number of design companies, and one of them is the big Ithala Arabia company, which is known. But they, in fact, as a design company, they don't employ any designers. They have a, they, everybody's freelance there. It's kind of ironic that this is the situation there. So, in fact, there's no jobs for lots of ceramic and glass designers who are actually being created there in Finland. Uh, so we decided that to, to bugger that, we're just going to go and set up our own company and see how it goes. And maybe that experience of actually having no experience is the only reason that we actually went and did it. Uh, so we set up our own. At the, at the beginning, there was three owners, myself, Tony, and then also my father uh, bought in as well. Nowadays, we have 14 owners. This is not because it went so well. This is actually because it went so crap. We had to get more money in. We needed more owners. And then more money and more owners and more money and more, more owners. Uh, now we employ three people only. There's myself and two people in production. We probably would be too, except I'm in a five-year government grant in Finland, so for the next five years I could sit just on my arse and do nothing and I'd still get a, an actually monthly pay. But uh, so I was actually able to employ another person into the company on the production side to extract myself from production so I could do more design work. Uh, all products are being produced by hand in our own company, but that's not a philo philosoph uh, philosophy that we have to do that. This is really more that our resources only allow us to do that. We could go mass production. I would like to go mass production. But this is where we are at the moment. Uh, we're selling in roughly 25 countries worldwide. This sounds great, sounds massive, but actually in many countries, like in Ireland, we just have one shop maybe, or two or three or four shops. Uh, our turnover last year was roughly about 230,000 euros, I think, but we made 30,000 euros profit, and last year was the first time that we've made real profit, and I talked that our profit, in fact, covered all of our loan repayments. So, uh, the aim of the company when we set it up from the very beginning was to become one of Scandinavia's biggest design brands, best known design brands. That was simple from the very beginning. We had a clear aim, that's what we want to do. There's no point messing around trying to do something else, in my opinion, if you don't have a clear idea of really what you want to become. The philosophy, form follows function, does mean all objects have to look the same. This was both, let's say, a design philosophy, but also, in fact, it's a, an economic reality. Unless we do something different, interesting, we're not going to be able to sell. We won't exist in a couple of years' time. Uh, in setting up the company as well, we immediately decided to set up a brand rather than setting up two, two guys setting up a company and trying to sell products. The reason is, of course, a brand gives a kind of a an illusion also, an extra illusion to the brand. It, becomes, it, let, it lets people buy into the products. Versace and all these guys that do big advertising and that to get people to buy their products, which are actually very boring products in many cases because with such sexy ads, you think they're much more than they are and you're willing to pay more than they are. We needed to create a brand also to give that extra value to the products, to communicate also the other things around the products about who we are, where we're from, and these elements of it to add the value to the product. So, First of all, in the brand, of course, there was the people behind it. We had to put personality into the brand. We also had to put a story. The press are interested in people. People are interested in people. We're so interested in Edward because of his, him, his family story. So we had to put behind the company the two people that are there and also the stories of the other designers and that. 
uh, was it to try to make it that it's more personal, easier to come in contact just because we're a smaller company and that. Uh, we're from Finland. Finland is an interesting company for people internationally. First of all, it's well known for design. We have to use every marketing channel we can, and of course, there's the Scandinavian design concept, and we'd be idiots if we didn't put Finland big on our name so people can kind of find us easily as a Finnish Scandinavian company. Also from Finland, Santa Claus is from Finland. The Swedes will try otherwise to tell you, but it's not. He's from Finland. Uh, there is Rally Drivers, Mika Hakkinen, and there's Lordi, who won the Eurovision Song Contest, again, doing something different, and that's how they won it. So Finland has all of these kind of, let's say, weirdos and queer kind of, kind of different uh, elements to it, and this is what we try to use also in our marketing. Uh, obviously, the brand, then the products are also another important part of the brand. They have to be different. That's, we'll come back to that in a second. And then the name Tonfisk as well. Uh, in our name, we always use Suomi Finland. Finland is a bilingual country. It's Swedish and Finnish together. Suomi is actually Finland in Finnish, and Finland is Finland and Swedish, if you understand that. <laughs> Tonfisk design is a Swedish word. Uh, we found it because we were looking for, we had been trying to think of the name for a year already. Couldn't think, we decided, okay, this, this one night we have to decide what the name is, good or bad. And we're three of us at the time. We went to different places, the apartment, pen and paper, put down words. Somebody's in the kitchen, saw a kind of tuna fish, saw the word tonfisk on it, put the word down. And we started discussing, and I was thinking, like, what, what's this word tonfisk? Tony was really kind of animated. This is kind of really a good word. And what does it mean? It means tuna fish. And I was thinking, what the hell do we want to call the name our company tuna fish for? But the more we discussed about it, if you don't know what it means, it's a nice looking word. <laughs> uh, if you do know what it means, you're immediately there, like, what the hell? I mean, you stop. We've had a, a Swedish woman at, the, at a fair walking past. She sees the name. She goes, do you know what that means? And I go, yeah, OK. And she goes, <laughs> uh, then, of course, also the advantage to it is we could do anything we wanted underneath that name. So our style could change, etc. any products we could do, and we're free to do that. The other names we had are kind of quite pretentious, or they actually kind of boxed us into doing a particular style. So I'll show you four products very briefly. This is the Warm series. It's my thesis work. Uh, I suppose my father was part of the kind of design in this is that I, I loved mugs, but he didn't like using mugs because they burnt his fingers. So I suppose I tried to design a, a tea set with a mug which he might actually like to use. And uh, there's the wood is a kind of a, a wooden bracelet around it which just holds onto the mug. And I suppose with this, the important thing was because I'm, my background's industrial design, I wasn't just used to using ceramics. I was thinking of mother materials all the time. So at the time this was launched, this was maybe quite different on the international market, that those two materials being used together. After that, of course, it, it started to become much more kind of common that it's been used. But uh, this has been an evergreen for us, and we're very fortunate to have created this kind of design, that uh, it's been the design that's kind of held the company afloat throughout the years and is still setting very well today. Uh, the cost for extendable vase is another just simple product, but the idea is if you push down the wooden part, the vase gets smaller, put it up, the vase gets larger. Again, trying to do something smart and different in the design. The wood helps as well, of course, if people notice it and stop for a second and take a look at it, and then they understand. Uh, chess set, this is another way somehow designs are created uh, in this case, I was at a friend of mine, he, he's a woodworker, uh, he had his, shop, his, his woodwork shop, and on the bench he'd been making tables, and the offcuts at the end of the tables were on the bench stacked together, and it looked like the, the surface of the board there. And the idea came to my head, oh, a chessboard would be cool if it was like that, and then if you could move the blocks around, you could make different terrains and that. So this is where this idea came from. And then one, one more product I show is our Newton Milk and Sugar set. This is pour the milk and the sugar bowl revolves there. And then if you want to put more milk in, you just simply lift the sugar bowl out of there. Uh, design, which many companies forget about, is the problem for designers, is that they think design is, oh, some artist design, he just thinks up to something and then they go and make it. The problem is it takes five months to come up with such a simple idea. Ceramics has been something that's been done for thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years. I mean, every cup has been done already. It's, a, it, it's so difficult to do something new in ceramics. So, you really have to dig and dig and dig to get some, you know, you have to work for months to try to think of a new design if you're starting from scratch. And so it takes that time to find this little nugget of difference, this little nugget of detail. And so Tanya was a student doing it. We're, we've done, created five or six products with students, and each of them has always taken four or five, six months to create. 
and she was watching TV after being on the project for already four or five months, and she saw an ad with a roller coaster in it, and then the idea came to her head. Uh, sales and marketing, roughly 45% of our sales are wholesale, 55% are direct and business gift. Originally, we, we were discounting the direct and business gift ourselves, and that was a mistake to make at the very beginning. Uh, we were looking at the wholesale completely, thinking we go to a fair, we get the connections, we sell lots of products. It just didn't work that way. Uh, in recent years, particularly in the last three years, we've, we've turned our gaze much more that our resources are used for the direct and business gift. And of course, we take care of the wholesale as best we can, but we, I don't really put much work into it anymore. The reason is direct and business gift, our margins are much bigger, obviously, when we sell the product. I'll come back to the pricing shortly. But on that side, I mean, we can offer a better price to the customer when we sell direct at some kind of fair, and also, we get a lot more money into our hands. And the difference between getting, let's say, uh, 24 euros and 20 euros can be an extreme difference, actually, in how profitable the company is in the end. So last year, I mean, we've predicted this year, if I can increase just direct sales 20,000 euros in the whole year, I can increase our profit well over 10,000 euros in the whole year and get an extra 10,000, 12,000 euros onto profit. That's because the margin is that if I increase 20,000 euros in wholesale, I'm not going to get any extra profit at the end of the year. That's the reality as a small producer at the moment. Uh, main, let's say, marketing concept, of course, we try to buy in, get, get into the Scandinavian design concept because there's books, there's exhibitions, there's magazine articles, there's shops that sell Scandinavian design, web shops, et cetera, et cetera. So let's say that's our main concept that we, we, we kind of work around. With dealing with any buyers, whether this is professional buyers or also, what's it, uh, uh, consumers themselves. I mean, the thing is, try to make it down to that we have a minimum number of decisions that anybody has to make when they want to buy it. And so a if a, a wholesale buyer contacts, we try to give them a ready, a ready package. We have the catalog, we have an order form in Excel ready for them with all the price. They can just type in 88441010 and just immediately see the price down there. If they like it, they're happy, save it, email it back to me, there it is. See the, see the product, see the price, you like it, you buy it, there it is. They know how much it's going to cost them to send it, they know what the delivery time is going to be, everything. Also, in, in fact, also on the, the consumer side, it's the same thing. Unfortunately, this is the problem for a small company as well. You can't control how the product is going to be put on display in a shop. And this is why selling to shops is also so difficult. Maybe it's put on display well, maybe it's put on display badly. Maybe the person there knows what they're talking about and they've actually learned about the product. Maybe they haven't. Maybe the price is on display, maybe it isn't. And so you never know. We don't have the time to be going around, going around different countries and trying to kind of get our product back in a kind of a, a good place to sell. With the consumers, we always try to do as well the same thing, that you have the product in front of them, you have the big price, you have the kind of name of the product, they understand it, and you have lots of product behind it, so that it's very easy. Nice product, nice price, I'll have that, thank you very much. And another part, part of the thing, for example, selling direct is that if I'm at a table here, I don't have products this way across the table. People don't read this way if they're walking this way, they read this way. So that the product is one product, two product, three product, four product. That way they can possibly pick up the things. Because if they're at a sales, if you're at a fair, the same thing. You're seeing if you're at a fair, there's 10,000, there's, there's thousands of objects there. How are they going to spot your object in the two or three seconds that they walk past your booth? And if you think about an ambiance fair, which we go to, which is in, in Frankfurt, which is a massive fair, if anybody's gone to Frankfurt, it's 10 halls. Each hall has about four or five floors, and these are big floors. And there's just thousands of companies, kind of thousands of products being sold there. I mean, one of the, one of the, 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 the products, they're, they're walking past your stand. You're literally three meters wide. This is the time they've gone past your stand. That's it. That's been your selling time to catch their attention. And how, how, how do you do that? It's got to be very simple. Product has got to be just out on display for them. Uh, but the problem is also there, you've got to be in the right hall because if you're not in the right hall. They're not going to spend the half an hour to try and walk over to another hall or how the hell anyway do they find you when there's 10 halls with three, three, three floors per hall. Uh, internet is also very important, of course, nowadays, goes without saying, direct sales, but also it's a major way that people find your products. They send you an email, you send them back the information. There's no calling done in, involved in a lot of our sales at all nowadays. It's just pure email 
that we're doing a lot of it through. So uh, key words and everything on our website. And of course, the advantage of websites is that nobody knows how big we are, in fact, from the website. We look as big as any other major company out there from the website. In fact, we're tiny. Uh, press is very important. Uh, good press photos. I mean, the press, there's how many magazines have been set up in recent years, and they're just crying out for information because, I mean, there's, there's just there's 20 interior decorating magazines. Now, how much actually interior decorating news is there to tell? If you can give them the information, give them to well, a good press release, a good picture there, and give it to them, there's a, there's a decent chance, if it's an interesting piece, that they might actually pick up on it. And of course, events are very important also we started doing. This is only some, something we started doing in recent years, uh, that we go and try to do, let's say, jazz events, uh, tall ships races, places like this, try to get ourselves in front of people all the time. So I'll talk about that a little bit later again. So how did we go? Well, the first year we started off, we're straight out of college. We have no experience. We don't have any production set up. We have no marketing contacts. Uh, so we had some capital to set up, but the minute we get the kilns, the computer, and all this kind of stuff, we have no money left over. And so, not surprisingly, no profit. And also now we have a, a knife to our throat each day because we have no money left over. And just a complete mess behind the scenes, to be honest with you. Extremely stressful. But we, the one thing we did well was we had some very nice product and we built a really good brand profile. And that saved our asses. And we ridiculously, we started getting contacts from around the world, but some of them we were able to handle well and some of them didn't go so well because we didn't have the logistics set up properly. We didn't have the production properly. We were late with some of our deliveries and things like that. But we were starting getting featured in magazines we find beside Villaroy and Bach and Wedgwood. And of course, Wedgwood's gone and Tonfisk is still here. That's maybe that's something to say. <laughs> Uh, but Villaroy and Bach is, and the, these are the massive companies of this time, and we're being featured, you know, right beside them as if we're kind of like, and, and, and then we're back in our small studio back in Helsinki wondering how we're going to pay the phone bill. Uh, after about two years came the crunch that we needed to get more, and, uh, more money in. I mean, we had taken loans from our parents and that, but it was running out now. We found, luckily, new owners purely by mistake that Tony was in the pub with a friend of him mentioned this situation. He was working in a company at the time that actually went up and became one of the bigger owners in Thontis Design. A pure accident. Unfortunately, it was a bad move. They didn't, have the, they didn't bring to us what we needed. They brought some money in and took some shares off us. But they didn't have the experience. We actually needed production experience and we needed more marketing experience and they didn't bring that to the table. They thought, if they give us the money, we'll be able to do the thing. We thought, now they're giving us the money and they'll start running it better and we'll do the design. So it's kind of a miscommunication maybe there, isn't it? Uh, also, we made stupid mistakes is that we thought, now we've got some money and now we can start actually taking the proper wage. Now we can get people into production so we don't have to be slogging away in production. So we ended up with a situation where two people in production and three people in the office. And that just doesn't work. Uh, you need about five people in production for one person to sit on their ass in the office. So we had uh, expenses of about 20, 25,000 euros per month, expenses. And the company was just going like this very, very fast. Uh, maybe our own inexperience that we are maybe so young, uh, whatever you want to say. Such a, such a lack of capital. We got more capital in with more owners because we, we didn't get the expenses down. That All that capital went out. So we ended up with 14 owners in the same position all the time. Uh, and of course, an extremely stressful position. Everybody's saying, well, make new products, make new products. You can't design if you're stressed like that. It just doesn't work. So on, after about five years, though, we, we, we hit a position where major changes had to be made or it was just going to go under with quite a lot of debt on top of our heads as well. And pretty much overnight, uh, three people left the company uh, I jumped back into production, my wage was cut in half, and what's it, uh, that meant that financially we stopped going plummeting downhill. Because we got the finances back under control, well, actually, I'll get back to that in a sec now. At the same time that there's a complete and utter mess behind the scenes going on, uh, we're being featured on the, the Chinese version of El Decoration on the cover of it. Uh, we're being done, people, the article being done in the Financial Times, it was ridiculous. Uh, international books, exhibitions, etc., etc., featuring us. Uh, design within reach, major US chain, furniture chain. We're not actually selling in the store, but 
were used on the, the, the cover of their, their catalogue. Uh, Dutch lighting company using us in, the, in their kind of photos as well and other TV brands and advertising. So from the outside, we looked like we were employing 10, 20 people maybe. After about five years, we had to make that big change. And because we got financial stability back, then a bit of some of the stress went and then you can start thinking about new products again. Slowly new products start coming, slowly we start getting somewhere. Uh, some of the changes that we made though were also in the production side and extremely simple changes. If we just had actually one, we, we just took that time one time to sit down for like one or two days. And one night I sat down and made a timetable for the production because we used to make by, we get an order, make it by the order. But this was terribly unproductive because I mean, he wastes so much time in between thinking and putting the moulds back on the table and off the table. I sat down one night and I made an actual timetable for the whole year. It was, a, it was a timetable which repeated every four weeks. And that increased our, our, our let's say, productivity immensely. Uh, we made two or three small changes to the production where previously a couple of the processes were the wrong processes, or maybe in our factory they're the wrong. We didn't have the right clay or that. So we are throwing away roughly 30% on some products we're going into the, into the waste. Now, if we're making, if it's costing us five euros, let's say, cost piece to make one piece, and we have 200 pieces in the kiln and we fire three days a week, that's possibly 600 to 900 euros worth is just going into the rubbish each week. And it, it, even if we weren't selling, that could be in the inventory. That would mean our, our loss would be much, much smaller as well. So by one or two small changes, switching, switching everything to casting, and a couple of other small changes, we, we got this waste down to 5%, practically overnight. Why didn't we do this three years earlier? I don't know. So eventually, over the years now, the past number of years, we've slowly, slowly, slowly got the company back up. That last year now, we made the 30,000 euros profit, mostly through direct sales. And because we slowly, our financial situation got a bit better, we could start thinking, well, I'll try out that fair, I'll try out that sales event, I'll try 200 euros here, 500 euros there. In the earlier financial situation, I just didn't have, you couldn't move anywhere, you couldn't do anything. Uh, if we want to talk maybe just a couple of things about, if I take each of these uh, headings here and talk shortly about them and come back to some of the things about Thonfisk also within them. Uh, design aesthetics, personally, I have my aesthetic that I work with very simple. There's no right or wrong aesthetic, I think. Everybody just has different tastes. But there is good and bad design. There is good and bad craft. And I think it's where you actually try to do something. You really think about it and come up with something original, come up with something different, or real skill used in the craft. People notice that, and people do appreciate that. Question is, can you offer it, of course, at the right price? Uh, Personality, try to also get into the products. Also, when I'm talking often, if I'm uh, maybe teaching sometimes in Helsinki or in Turku, where I am, I live at the moment, and which is the European capital of culture this year, so everybody welcome to Turku. Uh, small plug. But uh, I'm always actually saying almost actually design it wrong, because by designing it wrong, you maybe actually make it right because you get more personality in it. So people often go for the classic kind of size or proportions, and I'm saying, yeah, nice, everything works, but it's, you know, it doesn't catch attention. You've got to do something different. So maybe blow it up, make the proportions wrong, uh, squeeze it out, pull it apart, and, and try to get some personality into the design. Uh, functionality, of course, for us as a, a company making uh, products that you use, it's important because otherwise people get disappointed when they bring... The, the jug home with them and the thing just spills the milk all over the table. You know, it's much, much easier to sell to a customer who's already bought your product than try to find a new customer. It's ten, I think somewhere I read it's 10 times more easier to sell to an old customer than a new. So if you disappoint them on the first purchase, and it, especially if they're paying 50 euros for the, for the, the milk jug, if you disappoint them, they're going to be pretty pissed off, to be honest with you, in the end. Uh, and then I suppose the main thing is, which I think maybe for craft people and design people, which they don't sometimes remember, is that it's good to have a whole concept. It's good not to just do the cups and the teapots. It's good to have the whole kind of, let's say, uh, collection. 
And we didn't have that at the beginning. It was one thing. We had a nice cup and teapot. We had one other product here. We had one other product there. But there wasn't a whole kind of collection as a whole. And I think even shops in that like this idea of a whole collection. It, it, they can see it easier in their head that they put it there in the shop. Or even consumers, even though they're only going to buy maybe the cups or the teapot, just that they can visualize the whole thing is incredibly important with the sales. So uh, many companies, for example, we have, many very, we may have over maybe 100 products in our range altogether, but actually maybe five, six, ten of them max actually sell in, in larger volumes. But that's not the important thing. We need the other products there to create that whole concept, to create the kind of idea that we, we're much kind of bigger. Uh, so I, I think it's, it's, it's even if you're doing furniture, you've got to consider, depending on the, on the pieces that's been done, for example, that do you have to do also the side tables, the stools, and that kind of stuff, just again to create that whole idea of a concept, even though you're going to just be selling perhaps one piece of that range in, in actual volumes. Uh, brand identity, without having created the brands that we did, we wouldn't be here, we wouldn't have been around after two years. It continually, when people have bought into the company, when they've spent 10,000 euros or something to buy shares in us, it's because the illusion that they've seen of the brand, that they think this is going to be such a successful brand. And that's because we were, we were fortunate enough to build the brand so well, the, the, the kind of identity of the company. And, and you can really create a lot of illusion or create a very, very strong emotional contact if you put the branding together right. There's a lot of uh, alternative, let's say, brands around nowadays with Ben and Jerry's ice cream and, and a lot of these smoothies and, and, and things like that where, again, they're trying to create a, a different type of brand identity to kind of catch people, catch people with. And, and so this is the one area which we did succeed very, very well from the very beginning. Positioning very quickly just say you've got to just decide wh what you want to be. Are you low end or are you high end? And then you've got to really just go there. I think sometimes people are, are trying to be everything to everybody and it just doesn't work. So this is maybe one thing with Thonfisk as well. At one stage we were a little bit confused but then we concentrate on, on trying to find who is our actual buyer and then maybe stick with him. Of course other people are also interested in our products but at the beginning you have to concentrate on maybe particular kind of a, a buyer, get them, get the reputation out and then maybe it starts spreading out down. They talk in marketing about the, the pyramid. At the top there's the buyers that will buy things immediately when something is new and then it starts to trickle down to, to everybody else. And that trickling down happens a lot because the, the repetition but there's also problem is, is that when we started off with the company and we were at some sales events, we'd only sell, you know, 10 cups and, and one teapot. And I was thinking, what the hell's the problem here? You know, I've got this great design. Uh, it's been featured in a big newspaper article and nobody's buying it except one or two people. All of us, or most of us, including myself, are that we need to see something maybe 10 times, 50 times before we actually buy it. So the first time we see it, for, for example, new, new, new styles of shoes, it's often I see a new style of shoe and I think, Jesus, why, why is that guy wearing that? They're really weird looking. And then kind of a little bit later, six months later, I've seen many times, actually, they're, they're not so bad, actually. Yeah. Then kind of you know, a year later, two years later, actually, I'm going to buy one of those ones. And that's the way it works. We just need to get used to seeing the product and then we kind of grows on us as well. And... Uh, so this day when we go to a sales, we sell, we sell more as well as that. So at, at the beginning, you have to kind of maybe just decide who you're trying to get. So, but in, in marketing, marketing actually isn't very innovative. There's nothing very innovative to do in marketing. I mean, there's people there and you're just trying to sell the product to them or you're trying to tell your, tell your message to them. The problem is, is that everybody else is trying to also tell their message. So there's a consumer here, and there's I don't know how many hundreds of thousand companies out there, and they're all screaming at you every day to buy their product. And the only companies that are getting through to you are, let's say, the McDonald's, the, the Coca-Cola, because they just spend immense amounts of money putting adverts on all the time. And one example I have is always that you're in the middle of the city, and you're really hungry, and you need to get something fast. What comes into your head? For most people, it comes into your head McDonald's or something similar because these guys have spent so much time advertising, 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 and also sticking their, 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 their restaurants around you. You don't think of this actually very nice cafe just around the corner, perhaps, which has some good sandwiches and that, because you just don't, it doesn't come into your head with, at that time. You, you react to the messages you've received earlier. 
So marketing isn't, in fact, that innovative. It's just how do you get your message through all of that noise of everybody else screaming, buy me. And one reason is our products are different because that's one way we can try to get our message through. Uh, I think the only other way that small companies, you don't have a lot of money to use, but new, new areas, let's say, like the, the Twitters, uh, the, 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 the Facebooks and these, these give a kind of way that maybe virally you can start spreading the word a lot easier than, let's say, before. Uh, one of the important things, of course, when you're launching a product, you have buyers, for example, is to try to go and say new. New is always something that catches people for a second, and they'll look at it, and then maybe, you know, you'll get them. Whereas the problem is, of course, for all of us as crafts people are design smaller companies, is you can't be doing new all the time, but maybe you can do a new color, a new size, these kind of things, somehow to just keep, keep people's attention up. But with market, marketing, the main thing, I think, is repetition is you just keep going on and on and on, and Tonfisk is here, and Tonfisk is here, and Tonfisk is here, and remember, Tonfisk is here, and eventually, at some stage, it's going to, going to bite. So when we're doing the marketing for a wholesale, I'm trying to once a month send an email out to remind them just, I'm not trying to sell them in the email, I just say this article is being done, this product is here, or we're going on holiday, just to remind them all the time that we're just there. Because timing is everything. We don't need to buy products all the time. We don't need a cup to buy all the time. Sometimes we have a wedding we're going to, or a birthday, or somebody's graduating, we need a present. That's when we need to buy a cup. But if I only tell you once in the year about Tonfisk, well then, you're not going to remember when you actually need that wedding present nine months' time about Tonfisk. You'll have forgotten, you'll be rushed, the kids will be nagging at you, your husband will be saying something, your wife will be doing something, and you'll just think, I just need a present, I just, oh, I'll go to Arnett's, so I'll go to wherever and just grab something. And this is why Tonfisk is trying to all the time just do it the timing as we try to always send the emails, and maybe it hits at the right time that, oh, we're working on a restaurant at the moment, that's it, I need some cups, good thing that you sold me an email sent me an email. Uh, for people on the street, for example, we're doing sales events, we're trying to be all the time throughout the year, different happenings that's going on, just to remind them all the time we're there, and often it is that people are going by, I've looked at this for years and I've really liked it, now I'm going to buy it. Or there's a wedding that I'm going to now and this is really suitable for that. Uh, pricing for small companies like this, and this is maybe the biggest, biggest uh, issue why we're concentrating on, on, on direct sales at the moment. If a, if a product costs us one euro to produce, we're going to have to sell it at two euros. One euro to produce means that uh, the wages for producing it are covered by that in the materials. Uh, I'm going to have to sell it at two to cover all the office expenses, uh, to cover the rent, electricity, and everything else in the, in the uh, catalogs and all that kind of stuff. The shop that buys it in is going to have to sell it at five euros. They've got to cover all their expenses, and there's VAT on it as well. So that goes up to five euros. So something that costs only one euro to make is costing five euros in the shop. That's if you go directly to the shop. So I'm sale directly to the store. In reality, most products don't work that way, particularly if you want to get major export business. Uh, you're going to have to sell through importers. And in that case, they need to take their chunk out of it. So now you're, if you want to have a product that only costs five euros, it's going to have to only cost 50 cents to make. You're going to sell it, or I'm going to sell it at one euro, the importer is going to sell it at two euro, and the shop is going to sell it at five euro. And that's a pretty rough estimation. If you go into any store in this area of business and you take a product, divide by 10, and you know what maybe it's perhaps cost to actually make it. So for small producers like ourselves, how can we actually get our product in front of people if going through distributors and shops is going to knock our prices up by 10 times, or our production price by 10 times? And this is the major challenge, and this is why Thonfus took the decision a number of years ago. It cut out all its, it, its importers, it cut out its agents. We weren't selling through them. Importers, they want to move in volumes. They want a product that they get in, they send it off in volumes. They're not going to do individual work to try to sell one cup really hard and he ends up selling maybe, you know, 50 cups. You know, he can't get his money out of that, and he, or she, an Im importer. Uh, if you look at it as an agent, even, the situation gets even worse. Uh, agents typically take, let's say, 7 to 15% commission. Let's say we take it as 10% commission. 
Uh, let's say he wants an agent to get 5,000 euros a month to pay for his, his wage, uh, his car, whatever other expenses might have. That means they're having to sell 50,000 euros a month of product. Let's say they represent five brands, which would be realistic. That means 10,000 euros per brand per month. There's absolutely no way with a cost, cop costing 25 euros that he's going to sell 10,000 euros per month in, a, in, a, in countries like Ireland or Denmark or that. It just, even in, in, in bigger countries as well, it's just not going to work. Uh, so he needs to be selling a much more bulk item, which is selling in much more the hundreds or thousands of, of pieces per month that they can sell that amount to actually kind of pay, pay their bills as well. Uh, display, it's not something that a small producer can actually control in a shop, which it makes it very difficult, but display is everything about how well a product's going to sell. Packaging is the biggest key, key factor in that. If you can do, if you have the money to do good packaging, she, she explains the product, nice picture, creates the kind of illusion of, of where it's been used or that, that can affect greatly the sales. We are not able to do that yet, but it's something I'd like to work on more. But clustering, which is mentioned by Edna, is, is also extremely important. Uh, we have, I tried to finish up now soon enough, we have worked in Turku with six or about like seven or eight other small companies there. There's, a, there's a, a quite a amazing amount of small companies in Turku, like us, one, two, three-person companies. And we got together by accident doing one fair at one time, but afterwards we kind of thought, well, there's another fair, let's go and do that. And we already had the furniture made up in this, so we did that. But really when it got interesting was we was just before Christmas, and we thought, well, let's organize a, a Christmas sales together. If Tonfisk organized a Christmas sale in its own factory on its own, maybe we get 100, 200 people there, and maybe we sell... Uh, two, three thousand euros worth, maybe max. But we'd have to spend maybe a thousand euros maybe on advertising to get people to know that it's actually happening. So it's not really worth it to send, sell three thousand euros but spend a thousand euros on advertising. Uh, if 10, 15 small companies come together, that's a hell of a lot more interesting for somebody to go, to go somewhere to a sales because there's so many different things that they can maybe find. Uh, also, then if all the companies are willing to put two, 300 euros into marketing, which is a very small amount, but if you have 10, 15 companies, you suddenly have 3,000, 4,000 euros worth to use in marketing. So you can really get some ads out there to let, to let people know that it's actually happening, the event. And we did this a number of times, and now let's say last Christmas, uh, we had roughly uh, 2,000 people visit us, 1,500, 2,000 people visit us over the space of three days, and joint sales were in the region of 60,000 euros. And we're talking about kind of 10 to 15 small size micro companies here, which 5,000 euros direct makes a hell of a difference. And in three days, they're selling that much. And, and Tonfis share, I think, was about 15,000 euros in three days. And we're talking about Turku also here, which is a small city of roughly 120,000 people. And people always say in Finland, but there isn't enough people in Finland. This is what we thought in the beginning as well, and was completely, completely wrong way. There's not enough people in Finland to sell these products to. That's why we're going to do export from the very beginning. That's what we did. But we ignored Finland at the beginning. But in fact, if in Turku in three days we can sell 15,000 euros, in Turku only, and that's just 120,000 people, and in Finland there's 5 million, and there's a whole the rest of the year, I mean, there's massive potential if we can only somehow do it at the right time and kind of cooperate together that we can do it cost effectively. Obviously, Christmas time is the golden period and the one kind of 10 days coming up to Christmas. Can we somehow, as a group, cooperate that we'd have about five or six sales points around Finland in different cities and maybe pull in at each of those sales points per company five, 7,000 euros worth? These are the things which smaller companies can work to do can do to, together to kind of also clustering of course you get a lot of experience between each other as well a lot of you can trade experience you can trade where you can get things done and, 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 and learn a lot also that way and global trends China obviously is one thing for a company like ours we're getting it a little bit squeezed in a way uh, China has immense potential as a sales destination I mean, if I had lots of money, I would go to China to set up shops over there because China is the same as the Finnish big company, Itala. Nobody knows in China Itala or Thonfisk. So we're just as big there as Itala might be. 
if we had the money to just go there and advertise and put the products at the right price. Uh, it's the same. The only things over there maybe that they, they're more knowledgeable about would be the very, very big brands, the Versace and these, the Dior and these kind of things. But otherwise, the rest, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a, a clean slate. Whereas Europe, US, these, these brands are already established. It's very difficult to kind of make a wedge between them and get your own name out there. Uh, China, of course, also has the other thing that the, the depression that happened basically knocked down wholesale prices generally by about 20 to 30 percent. So shops just closed up at that time. They stopped taking orders in, in, in Christmas 2008. And then by spring 2009, they were really looking for products which are 20, 30 percent lower in price. And this has created a run of also much, much major companies running towards China because they've got to create now ranges also for the department stores, which are about 20 percent, 30 percent cheaper than the previous ranges that they had. And for us in the future, if we really want to sell wholesale, I don't see, it. we'll have a few shops selling wholesale the way we are, but we're not going to get bigger selling wholesale with our production in Finland. It's just a reality. Growing wealth disparity is happening at the same time, and this is a problem as well, because the middle class is disappearing, or it's been shrinking in a lot of countries, Western Europe as well. And this creates a situation where our product, which isn't the most luxurious product, it's not a Versace, it's not a Dior, it's also not a cheaper product, it's not an Ikea. Our market is actually disappearing. The people who are perhaps interested in our products is slowly, slowly disappearing. The, the middle class is disappearing. Uh, so it's actually the luxury market is the one market which didn't decrease during the Depression. It's actually gone better, in fact, in some areas like China and that. It's just powered on, and in, in Europe it held its own. And of course, the internet, everybody knows it has massive potential, particularly, for example, trying to find small segment groups of the market. Because now you're not just be able to maybe access them in Ireland, you can access them even as 1% of people throughout the whole of Europe. And then you start 1%, maybe it actually starts being a lot of people, if you can access it properly. So for, for Tonfist Design, if I finish up now, uh, Director wholesale is the question for the answer. For, is the question for the future? How do we do it? At the moment, with our with our setup that we have, our own production, that we have to concentrate on the direct. Uh, I would like, however, to do wholesale properly. I would like to make Tonfisk into a major brand that you find in Brown Thomas, that you find in all the major department stores worldwide. Our owners want to do that as well. They're not happy that we're a two two hundred thousand euro turnover. They want over a million at least per year. And that's what I would like as well. That, of course, brings the question, is it made in Finland or designed in Finland? All people in all surveys that they do, they'll say they prefer made in Ireland, they prefer made in Finland. When they go into the shop and they use their monies, it's completely the opposite. <laughs> it's not that they're being bad, it's that they're wrong, but in economic reality, who of us actually has that money that we can decide that we pay twice as much because it's made here then another product which is equally as good, equally as good manufacture, equally as good design, made somewhere else, but is half the price. It's a no-brainer. And this is how people all the time in a survey, when people ask them, because there's an emotional thing, you don't want to answer back to, well, actually, no, I'm going to buy the Chinese version. People don't want to say that in public, but that's actually how they react with the money, and it's completely understandable. So I think for us, for example, again, there's a big question, really, for the, and it's the whole Finnish Finnish design sector at the moment as well. Is it made in Finland or is it actually just designed in Finland? The other question is about this, even if we shipped off, and maybe this is an important part to say in this, this conference, even if we shipped off all our production to China, let's say, we employ only three people at the moment, in reality only two people because I'm on the grant that I get from the Finnish government. In fact, if we shipped off to China and if we broke into the brand Thomas and this kind of stuff, we'd have at least two people in the warehouse sending, sending stuff out. We'd have several more people actually in sales than that. We could possibly get up to a million, two million in turnover. In fact, we'd be probably employing six to ten people then. More jobs. So necessarily shipping out or moving production to some other place it doesn't mean that you're actually creating less jobs in your own country necessarily. There's always, there's always arguments back and forth to that, but that's also kind of a, an example there of how actually maybe we can create more jobs here in Ireland by thinking about these issues as well. So, and this is our website, and there's also a web shot there, so a shameless plug at the end as well. So, <laughs> thank you.